A very good morning to you. This is the first online Sunday school. And this is something that is new that we are starting. This is not resuming Sunday school as we know it, because if we say we are resuming, that means we're opening our doors and everybody is coming back. It's going to be a little bit different, but we will adjust. So this is um, an online uh, approach to having our Sunday school. Sunday school is a vital ministry of the church. I think we know that. It is a time, a ministry where we can be instructed with biblical knowledge. It is an opportunity, a place where we can grow in understanding and knowledge of God. And of course, the Sunday school ministry is vital to be a strong church. Strong individuals, strong believers make up a strong church. And when I say strong, I don't mean physically strong. We talk about strength in the inner man. We talk about strength in faith. We talk about spiritual strength. And if there's ever a time that we need this strength, both physical, spiritual, mental strength, it is now. And so we felt that it is important for us to continue to have uh, a platform that would allow us to keep on studying the Word of God. Now, this Sunday school is not for the children. Children's Sunday school, uh, we perhaps will uh, explore how we can do that. Streaming is not always the best for young children. They learn better interactively. But this pose a challenge and a task that perhaps parents, will, we will need to, to embrace. And that is to learn how to lead our children, how to read the Scriptures with our children, to also take the role of the teacher. And that's not easy. Yeah. Aldine and I have been doing that this week. And I must tell you, it was not easy. When the children are having school now at home, uh, Christabel, it's a little easier. She, she's a bit more independent. She can do her own thing. But for James, it was, I must confess, it was a struggle for me uh, because I'm not in touch with his work as I should be. I uh, don't know how to be that teacher in the sense as how his teacher would teach him. And so I struggled. I got a little bit frustrated. And then I said to myself, okay, this is going to be the long term. I better change. I better learn. So the next day, with a little bit more patience, I hope I had more, I, with every day I'll develop more patience. And... Um, Let's try again. So it's going to take, it's not easy. I identify with parents that this is like asking a huge task. You've never done this before. It is, rather than give up, give it a go. And so this is why we're having Sunday school. To be your source of learning. To, for you to take your faith seriously, even more seriously. To take you, your, your even, your desire, your challenge to know the Bible even more seriously, that you may be able to minister, to teach your children at this point in time. It can be done. Well, this morning, Sunday school lesson will be a Palm Sunday reading. As we celebrate Palm Sunday today, I thought it would be fitting to read uh, a passage from the gospel concerning Palm Sunday. 
And the best thing to do is to read for knowledge. See, sometimes we celebrate things which we don't really know where it comes from. For example, Palm Sunday. Where is the the word Palm Sunday comes from? It actually comes from the gospel. Let's turn to John chapter 12. And in verse 13, this was the account that John uh, recorded. Right? Uh, it, verse 13 first. Let's take 13 and uh, 12, sorry, and 13 together so we can see this. Right? Uh, we read the next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. And this is where we get the phrase Palm Sunday, where we get the whole idea, the term Palm Sunday. You see, palm branches were used in the ancient days to welcome kings and conquerors. And so the multitude greeted Jesus with palm branches as he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Did they fully understand Jesus? Did they see him as the Messiah King? Perhaps not, when, as we read later on. So, what did he see him as? A physical king. They saw how he had power to raise Lazarus from the dead. They have heard about how he has healed people. And so they were very happy to say, this is our king who's going to lead us to free us from the oppression of Rome. So they were right and not quite right. They were right that Jesus is king. They were not right by thinking that he is going to be that physical king who is going to lead them, free them from the oppression of Rome or from any oppression like Moses did. See, so sometimes when we have knowledge, it's like a mixed bag. We don't quite fully understand. We think we know, and yet we don't really know. We, we right and yet wrong at the same time. This was the response of this group of people called the multitude. Right? Now, as we read the gospel, it is good for us uh, to look at who is the person who wrote this account. Right? Now, knowledge of the context of the passage we're reading. This is about the triumphal entry of Jesus. Good. Now, it's good to also know the author. And we can also be encouraged by how the author wrote what was his goal in writing, that we may benefit much in reading the Scriptures. Now, the one who wrote John, of course, is the Apostle John. Now, in the Gospel, there are a number of John. In fact, two Johns that stands out. One is John the Baptist. The other is John the Apostle. They are two different pe people altogether. Okay? So, they're not the same per person. John the Baptist was the forerunner of Christ. He was the one preaching in the wilderness, repentance, his ministry was essentially preparing, pointing people to Christ as the forerunner. Okay, that's John the Baptist. He did not write this gospel. The person who wrote this gospel account is John who became the apostle. He was originally a fisherman. That was his past before he was called. 
Okay? So the value here is, is, uh, is wonderful because this is an original disciple. He was an eyewitness to the whole thing. Now, how did he see it? How did he understand it? That is valuable to read and to appreciate, right? And so, here is John. How did he begin? Did he begin with such insight to write, with such knowledge, to be able to teach others now? He didn't. He began humbly. He didn't know much of the Scriptures. He didn't know much about the Lord. He didn't have faith in God very much. His faith was perhaps more of a traditional thing, a cultural thing, a family thing, but personal, it wasn't there to begin with. How did all that change? Well, it changed when he came to know Jesus. He responded to the teachings of Jesus, to the gospel that Jesus proclaimed. And faith was created in him. He became an original, dis uh, he became a disciple of Jesus, following, he took up the invitation. He came to Jesus to inquire, and he liked what he heard. And when Jesus offered the invitation, follow me, I will make you fishes of men, he took up that offer. He had to change. He used to be, had a very, very bad temper. He used to be ignorant with reference to uh, lack understanding, lack faith, and, and, and weak in every sense of the word. It took three years for the Lord to uh, teach, to, to guide, to correct. And then we see Him becoming an outstanding servant of God. He didn't turn into a servant of God overnight. He didn't become that beloved disciple of Jesus. The more he got to know the Lord, the more he began to treasure the Lord. He began to love the Lord deeply. This is John. And he became truly an outstanding servant of God. Gifted, knowledge, skillful, knowledgeable, skillful, he wrote not only the gospel, he wrote several epistles, three that is preserved for us in the scriptures, and he wrote what the most difficult book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. This is John. Okay? And he didn't do it because of he was smart, he was clever. It wasn't. He, he was able to do this because of the work that God began in him. The, the Spirit of God began to enlighten him as he yielded himself to the Lord. Okay, so same thing. For us, this must be our encouragement that the people who wrote this understand how we all start with very little understanding, with very, very little faith. And then, if we are humble enough to seek God for understanding, we can grow. We can be a blessing to ourselves, to our family, and to others. Okay? Well, that's John. Now, we're going to take a look at John's goal of writing. And he had a wonderful goal. We'll come back to uh, this reading. It's good to know him a little bit about him, about his goal, before we read this passage. Okay? And he had a very noble goal in his writing of the gospel. It's found in John 20 and verse 31. Okay? He became, he became really very much like the Lord Jesus as he followed Jesus. Jesus was a tremendous influence in his life, great impact in his life, and you can see it in the way he writes. As Jesus always ministered with a great sense of purpose. So did John. And John actually wrote his, the goal of why he's writing, and, and it comes from the purpose 
that is inside him. What was the purpose? So he shares this with his reader, and he's not shy to tell his reader up front why he is writing, recording all these things. So in John 20, verse 31, we read, and he says, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. Now, he's lived long enough to, ass to not assume that everyone who read will just come to faith automatically. That you may, may, not you will. It's up to the individual. It's up to how you will respond to what you read in the Scriptures, in the Gospel, to what it is written here. It's up to you, your part. He's going to do his part. But you've got to do your part. And if you respond well, you may, you can come, you can arrive at this faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And with this faith and that believing, you may, again, have life in His name. That faith will affect your life. How do you know you have faith? Watch how it would affect your life. John can tell you firsthand how faith in Jesus affected, changed his life for the better. From ignorance to knowledgeable. From unspiritual to spiritual. To, from carnal, focus only on the things of the world and the flesh, to one who love the Lord, to be able to be enlightened to see the things of God. That you may have life, a fruitful life, an abundant life that Jesus promised. Life eternal. Life as God meant it to be. You see, we build our life among all the things that are physical. And then when all these things are taken away from us. We almost got nothing to live for. You know, we can't see our friends, we can't see our extended family, we can't eat at our favorite restaurant, we can't go out anymore, we've got no life. See, we begin to realize our life is very physical. It's so focused on the physical. In the Sunday message, we will be talking about what is our call. Is there an eternal life? Is there a spiritual life? And this is our call. And if this is our call, it cannot be taken away. We can keep on living. We can keep on going. Sure, we, we, we feel it like the rest. We struggle. But we are reminded that there is a greater life that is inside us. And this comes through faith in Jesus. That's his goal. So read the scriptures with this in mind. You are, what is our response? If you read it, you have knowledge, you know about it, you can even discuss it, but it doesn't produce faith and life inside you. We're missing the point. We're missing the purpose of it all. Right? Now, let's now, with this, turn to the passage for this morning, right? So make the observation. Let's read this, and we will begin to see that even those who cried out, Hosanna, you know, we could say all the right things. We can maybe have uh, respect for Jesus. We can cry out to Jesus. We can even say Hosanna, which means save now. Bless, we can even bless Him. We can call Him King. And yet, that is all superficial. That can be all be superficial. 
Deep down, we don't really know who Jesus is. Deep down, we don't have faith. Deep down, we don't have that life. Because the multitude were very superficial. They only saw how they could benefit from Jesus. They only saw that He can heal, they will come. He can promise blessing, they will come. And when He was crucified, they fled. And perhaps some of them even changed their mind to calling out, crucify Him. This is the multitude. They are double-minded. They change wherever the wind changes. Jesus is not someone they truly believe in and follow. Now, this is what we must observe. See, when we read the Scriptures, we make observation. Now, when we go on further, in verse 14, we read about Jesus. Then Jesus, when He had found a, don a, a, a young donkey, sat on it as it is written. Now, why did Jesus do this? Why did He uh, arrange for a young donkey uh, to be provided for and He would enter into Jerusalem riding on a donkey? To the undiscerning, they may not think very much of it. But Jesus was absolutely not only discerning of the Scriptures, but of His Father's will. He was fulfilling the Scriptures, and we read it here. Jesus found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written. This is at the heart and mind of Jesus. His obedience to the Word of God. His obedience to the will of God. Verse 15 was the text, was the prophecy, where it says, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's cob. Jesus observed every detail. He could have just got any donkey, but nope, on a donkey's cob, a young donkey. This is now the skill of John to help people see Jesus. Look at how Jesus obeyed the Word of God. See, we can easily say Jesus fulfilled prophecy. But what does fulfill mean? You know what does it mean to fulfill prophecy? To embrace it. To obey it. That's fulfilled. That's Jesus' example. Not just to read the Word of God. Yes, we believe in it, we may say. We, we have found life in it, we may say. But do we fulfill it as Jesus fulfilled it? Obey it. Embrace it. Obey. Now, during these few weeks, we, we read on the news the people who disobey who are not embracing social distancing. No matter what they have been told, it doesn't matter if it comes from the Prime Minister or the health, uh, uh, Chief of Health, or, or even the police. People just want to do their own thing. They still go to the beach. They want to try still, you know, we can't gather outside. We're going to gather inside. Nobody can see. That's the defiance part in the human nature. We see restriction. We see, you know, we are being stripped away of our freedom or so-called whatever it is. We just don't know how to obey. There is a defiance part in the human being. And so the only way is for the government to slap fines, to threaten jail, Otherwise, we just don't obey. Look at Jesus. Here is the Father's Word. And He follows it 
to the latter. What a wonderful example Jesus is to us. Right? As it is written, and then Jesus did this. Now, we look at the multitude. We look at, the, they were very superficial. Uh, they will say whatever they need to say to get whatever they want. But we look at a contrast here. What an out, outstanding example in Jesus. Really knew the Lord's word. Really understood it. How do you know? He embraced it and he obeyed it as it is written. That's how we must read God's Word. Okay? Now, we're going to move on to now the response, the disciples. There are three things. The multitude we see, the Lord Jesus Christ we see. Now, observe, the disciples. Now, John, remember, the apostle, he's very, now he's honest, he's very candid. Okay? At that, this point in time, the disciples have been following Jesus for three years. Did they understand better? They may know a little bit better. They may have more experience than the multitude. They may say they have, ex they have really you know, committed themselves to following Jesus for three years, but did they understand fully? And the answer was no. If we are honest, we don't understand fully either sometimes what we are doing. Okay, look at John. And he said, his disciples, verse 16, including himself, this includes himself, his disciples did not understand these things at first. Haha. <laughs> so this is the redeeming factor. At first, right? If he just said he didn't understand, full stop, then we're sunk. We're, we're all in trouble. What? The disciples didn't understand? No, but he said, at first, this is called living hope. <laughs> right? But honest. Tell, be honest with ourselves. Actually, we don't understand it. So what shall we do? You know what? Try. Whatever means you need to understand, understand. And so uh, they said they did not understand. But when Jesus was glorified, meaning He rose from the dead, He was resurrected, Jesus came, appeared to His disciples, showed them, ate with them, speak to them, Hello, I'm not a ghost, right? I'm here. This is who I am. I told you I will rise from the dead. I have risen from the dead. We cannot imagine how the disciples, it took them a while to register, to kick in. But that's what God does for us. He reminds us. He helps us. He demonstrates for us until something, light bulb, moment comes in and ha, ah, we understand. Right? And so, when, but when the Lord was glorified, then they remembered. Ha. Ah, okay? See, it's very important that we learn. If you don't understand, at least remember. But if you don't understand and you don't remember, you're, you know, it's very hard. No chance. Okay? Give yourself the chance. All right. I am going to uh, at least be reminded of God every week, if not every day. I'm going to have access to the Lord. I'm going to try. I'm going to work at it. And then when you can remember, you know what? You can have a light bulb moment. We call enlightenment can come. And then these things they remembered that these things were written about Him, meaning the Scriptures. They began to connect the dots and that they had done these things to Him. Wow! Only then that understanding came. Right? And so there's our challenge. The disciples gives us a good uh, Example in that sense, 
not of the non-understanding, but the process to understand. Jesus is the most wonderful example of a person, of the Son of God, of one who truly understands the Word of God, the will of God. He obeyed, he, he embraced, he obeyed, he fulfilled, right? Now, the disciples is good in this sense to show us the process. We begin with not really understanding fully. We may be a bit better than the multitude, but actually, if we're honest, not all that better. Right? We celebrate Easter. What is Easter? It's about Christ and re- rising from the dead, and uh, Palm Sunday is about His triumphant entry. Great! How come we are none the wiser? We're none the stronger? Right? We panic like the rest? What does our knowledge do? When there is true understanding, watch your life change. Watch John change. Watch faith come. Watch that life, remember? That they may have life. Right? Yes, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, but the Word of God got to be explained. You've got to understand it. And as you do understand it, faith can come. And that faith creates this living, this life that is there, that life that God meant it to be, that we may have life. What is this life? A life that is truly identified with Christ, a life that is truly connected with the Lord, a life that follows Jesus, that aspires to be like Jesus in every sense of the word, to fulfill the Word of God, not just know the Word of God, not just understand the Word of God, but to fulfill it. The disciples don't understand the Word of God, even if they can quote it. Even they could say, Hosanna, blessed is he who came in the name of the Lord, King of Israel. They can quote it. A lot of people quote Scripture. There are people who use it in life. Do they really believe in it? Not really. Now here's the disciples. They believe in it. Good. But do you really understand it? Do you, sorry, do you really understand it? You know it. You really understand it. Understanding must come. Where is understanding? There is obedience. Embracing, there is obedience. And watch that life of Christ is created inside you. That's what John experienced. That's what he wants to share with others. Don't just speak. Don't just quote Scripture. Don't just use Scripture just like that. Truly understand the God who wrote these words. Know the Lord. Come to faith in Him. Understand the Lord even more and see that life created inside you. I always end the Sunday school with a challenge, and this is not going to be different, and we must be challenged by the Word of God. Remember, why are we reading this? What is the purpose? There is a purpose. His purpose is to create faith. Faith initial, faith Mature, growing, mature, strong, enlightened, fruitful, you name it. Not just initial. Faith, a deep faith, a faith with understanding, with wisdom. It changed your whole life to be like the Lord. That's our challenge. Okay? May this Easter be a time of celebration. I know we cannot gather together. I know we feel isolated. We could be frustrated. We could be, look, it comes back to this, our faith. We have everything taken away. We feel we have everything taken away. We don't. We really don't. We are having it good. Thank God we can still have 
many things. Now, I read of how the people are complaining about the hotel food as they're being quarantined in five-star hotels. And then I saw a video of how India is quarantining some of the people. They make them squat down and they spray disinfectant on them. It's a world of difference. Maybe some should experience that and then begin to treasure. What is inside us? Let there be not a complaining spirit. Did Jesus complain about the Word of God? About how come the Father's will is so hard to follow? He has to suffer. He has to die. He didn't. This is maturity. This is understanding. This is faith in God. He embraced. He obeyed. He triumphed. This is the triumph of Christ. Even when nobody else saw it, not even the disciples at that point, Jesus did. Let us see with eyes of faith too. Let there be triumph. The triumph can come when we embrace the Word of God with understanding, of course. Believing in it by obeying it. And watch the same spirit of faith can be created. May the Lord bless you this morning as you read the Lord's Word and may He bless your family too. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank You that we can still study Your Word. We thank You for the facilities that is provided for us. Though we need to change, we need to learn perhaps technology to have access, but these are changes that we must learn to make. We know we have to change in the way we are isolated. We have to change in practicing social distancing. Let there be wisdom to know that this is good for not only us, but for the entire nation and the world that is battling this pandemic. We pray for our Prime Minister and, and the leaders and all the frontline workers who are working night and day that, they, that lives may not be lost physically, financially, and more. That they, are, they know they cannot stop this, but they're trying to reduce the impact. They are like just us, with families, with a mind that can take a toll. And so we pray that, Lord, you have mercy, you give them the strength and the wisdom they're going to need. Your grace be upon them. We may not be up there to make those decisions, but we will pray for them. We will do our part as obedient children of God would. And we ask that you will give us the strength this week to find the joy as we remember what Easter is all about. The Lord came for us and we come to Him. Ask that you would bless this Easter week ahead. And we look forward to coming together in our heart and our spirit, wherever we are, to celebrate Easter this coming Sunday. We ask for your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.